uh, 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 extreme sort of curvature term with an arbitrary coefficient. Yeah. Is that in, possible? In, in principle, it's possible. In an effective field theory sense, that's certainly possible. Yeah. Yeah. But then you would have to treat those as small uh, surface corrections. I, I guess th there was more serious problem is that uh, now you don't have a well-defined uh, variation principle. Yeah, but that's that's why you guess that's why you have to treat them perturbatively. So if you treat them perturbatively, there's no problem. We could just we can discuss okay. about it okay. later. But yeah, if I if I just view this in a standard effective field theory sense, then there's no there's no, there's no prior obstruction to adding uh, arbitrary functions of R's and intrinsic curvature. But if I if but you're right that then if I if I make an arbitrary coefficient of k, then I mess up the variational problem there. Right? Um, but you can make sense of it in a particular way. But you can't treat it to be large. But that's a subtle point that uh, uh, can talk about uh, Now, you can easily generalize this, and, and uh, people have, including myself, uh, to by uh, uh, going up to higher dimensions. And in fact, we have the framework called cascading gravity, uh, where in fact you can you can go further, and you can imagine we're on a brain that lives on a brain that lives on a brain, and so on and so on, in higher dimensions. And then you can you can get a cascading effect where gravity interpolates from 4D in the UV to 5D to 6D and 7D, etc. Whatever you want, uh, just by generalizing that procedure. Um, and uh, so uh, so that's that. Now I want to talk about a different idea. Um, now, in fact, so this particular model I'll come back to because. Uh, it led to many of the ideas that re-emerge in the context of mass of gravity, uh, which you'll hear more about later. Uh, but let me talk about a slightly different idea, uh, which is the idea of dimensional deconstruction. Uh, and this is an idea um, that uh, was originally considered for gauge theories by uh, Akani, Hamed, Cohen, and George I, and then Akani, Hamed, and Schwartz were the first to think about this for gravity as well. This goes back to 2001, uh, something like that. And the idea here is to actually write down, uh, so here I've come at you with theories which are in higher dimensions, and for simplicity, I just have one extra dimension, which you can easily generalize that. Here the idea is that we work entirely with theories in four dimensions, uh, but that those theories have some limit in which we effectively look five-dimensional. And essentially this occurs because what we're going to do is essentially think of the extra dimension as being discrete. If you like, the extra dimension is going to be um, replaced by a lattice. But if we're in one dimension, if we have only one extra dimension, then uh, what we're effectively going to do is replace the extra dimension by a set of points, uh, y is ln over n, so we have n points, so little n goes from 0 uh, to n minus 1, there are n total points, uh, and then we replace the field as a function of y by a discrete label phi n at each of those, each of those points. So the simplest way uh, to uh, to get the dimensional deconstructed theories is actually to start with a high dimensional theory and deconstruct them. Uh, but the philosophy of this approach was actually to think of it the other way around. So we start, we, we fundamentally have a four dimensional theory, but that four dimensional theory in some limit uh, looks high dimensional. Uh, and so the way you do this is you just discretize if you were uh, computing the intervals on a computer. So instead of this interval, I just replace that by uh, discrete sum, which is just uh, uh, how you define the interval in some approximation. So you just learn how to do the interval, calculated by a sum. And then I can replace the derivative Place that by there's some ambiguity here, um, but one particular choice would just be to take it by the difference. So really, what we have now is we're going to have a four-dimensional theory 
in which we have not one Newtonian potential, but a family of Newtonian potentials phi n. We have n of them. So there are a finite number of Newtonian potentials. And so our theory is described uh, in this first case, phi g. I guess in principle you can have different uh, uh, g's for each n, but you can also just uh, redefine phi n to absorb that g difference, so I should ignore that fact. And then the gradient energy from the y derivative that just comes from this group, something like this. And then you can have uh, matter coupling to each of those Newtonian potentials in a different way. This is a purely four-dimensional theory with a finite number of fields, but obviously, in some limit, it reproduces uh, the five-dimensional theory. In particular, if that again goes to infinity, then uh, we know that uh, it should just give you the five-dimensional theory. Uh, so in this particular case, we'll also get a theory in which we have Kalitsa-Klein states. The difference between them, the difference with Kalitsa-Klein theory, is that there will only be a finite number of Kalitsa-Klein states. Uh, and that's easy to see because, in this case, the modified Poisson equation is uh, this, just reflecting the fact that this is the double y derivative, and I've just discretized that y derivative. And then to solve this, what we can do is do a discrete Fourier transform. So we define the discrete Fourier transform phi tilde uh, by sum over n, the i n be 2 pi over n, uh, and then rho tilde. Discrete version of the Fourier transform, and the phi tilde p's are essentially the Kalitsa Klein modes. Except now there are a finite number of them, just as n goes from 0 to n minus 1, p, uh, there are only n of the p's as well. So here you have a finite number of Kalitsa Klein states, and this particular choice then uh, diagonalizes the mass term uh, so now we have in terms of the uh, Fourier modes or these glutes of fine modes we just have a Poisson equation with a mass term and the mass here is, uh, if you rewrite it, it's 4 over L squared uh, sine phi p over n squared. And of course, as promised, as n goes to infinity, uh, uh, this just reproduces the, uh, uh, this effectively uh, reproduces the masses for the normal Kalitsa Klein uh, tower. So the deconstruction framework. Um, which uh, so you can you can you can run this uh, you can perform the same trick in the full gravity case uh, and what you get is different than Kalitsa Klein theory is you'll get a theory of a finite number of nonlinear interacting massive gravities and hopefully I'll get to that in uh, later lectures okay so. So that was a sort of brief introduction to, ver to various different ideas. So just to remind you. But all these are ideas in which you modify gravity, but you do so in a way by effectively uh, having a tower, be it finite, be it discrete, be it continuous, be it infinite, but a tower of massive Kalitsa Klein modes. So Kalitsa Klein theory. Randall syndrome 
both have towers. Uh, but in that case, they give UV modification to gravity. And then, whereas the Duali Gavadetsi variety model, and also appropriately performed the deconstruction, gives IR modification. So uh, that sort of prompts more thought about what it means to have. Uh, with gravity being propagated by uh, mass gravitons, uh, be they uh, be a single one or any number of them. And so now what I need to do, and I'm not gonna finish this today, but now what I'm gonna start doing is, is think about what, what is this analog story now in the relativistic context? So all that was in the Newtonian context. What, how does this get changed in the relativistic? Well, things get slightly more subtle now because instead of just the energy density, the mass density, we should really think about uh, T mu nu, the full stress energy. And instead of the Newtonian potential, we're going to have uh, H mu nu, which is the metric perturbation. <coughs> and as well as forces, you can also have forces, as, uh, as Professor Rosen mentioned earlier, you can have forces which are sourced by this, the stress energy T mu, or also scalar forces uh, sourced by uh, trace T itself. And there are many theories, many modified theories of gravity in which you have extra forces uh, sourced by the trace of T. But typically, we don't think about theories. So this would, this would come from scalars or spin zero particles. This would be an appropriate coupling for spin two. Typically, we don't think about uh, the vector case, uh, not only because it doesn't just give you an attractive force, but also because vectors would have to couple to a vector, and the only vector I can construct out of T mu is that one, and ideally we want that to be uh, zero, at least roughly, and we want that stress energy uh, to be. With that. So, uh, what gets modified in the in the, <coughs> the relativistic theory is the tensor structure uh, for how you couple to T and U, and that tensor structure is very important and is the origin of uh, so-called BDVZ discontinuity, uh, which is the distinction, which is why a mass, massless graviton is not the massless limit of a massive graviton, despite the fact that you think it would be. So let's understand that, uh, how that arises. So let me think about gravity. Let me just think about Einstein gravity in D dimensions for a second. And what is the analog of what I've been computing uh, up, up to this point? So the action for Einstein gravity in D dimensions, uh, MP here is the Planck scale. We're going to use, uh, uh, instead of using 1 over 8 pi g, I'm going to work with with the Planck scale, and then the einstein helmet action looks like something like that, and then to that we add Lagrangian for matter. I won't dwell too much on uh, what that is. So we might be in there in front if you want to. And we're going to consider this in the weak field region, and the Newtonian limit is, of course, weak field, uh, but the Newtonian limit is more than that. It's also static. Uh, non you know, highly non-relativistic weak fields. Uh, but there's more in the weak field. You can also have relativistic weak field limits, which is important, to, in particular, say, binary pulsars when you're emitting gravitational radiation. And so let's think more generally in the weak field limit, but now fully relativistic. So I'm going to take the metric uh, and expand it around Minkowski space, just for simplicity. And so if you expand this action to quadratic order, then uh, you get a well-known answer. Um, the full answer is somewhat co complicated. The 
let me give you a shorthand way. So expand to quadratic order. Then the einstein hilbert action expanded to quadratic order can be written like this, where this thing here is what defines what's called the Lichnerowitz operator. And the matter Lagrangian is expanded uh, with a linear order, uh, with quadratic order, and if you treat the sources in first order, um, this this is just this just comes about in the form of the definition of the stress energy. And so I need to tell you what this guy is, the Lichnerowitz operator. So this is just the einstein hilbert action. Uh, this is basically just G mu nu linearized. Linearized or complicated. This Jimmy New Octave factor, I should think of factor. So this is true in any dimension, this is the Vishnerovitz operator. Uh, but it becomes much simpler if we choose so-called Dedonda, or harmonic gauge, in which um, we saw this earlier, and we can choose make this choice. So we use the gauge freedom that is inherent in this theory, because we've still got diffeomorphism in rates, to choose the gauge where this is equal to zero. Then in that limit, the Lichnerowitz operator simply takes the form box h menu minus one half e to menu trace h, where h is the trace of the stress energy. So obviously that's a major simplification, which makes life much easier. So in this gauge, equation of motion, the analog of the Poisson equation <coughs> that you get by varying that action uh, takes the following form, box. So the Laplacian now is replaced by the box. Uh, and then rho is replaced by t mu. The factors work out to be uh, something like that. And uh, we can rearrange that by, if we take the trace of this equation, then we'll get uh, 1 minus d over 2, h minus 2 over mp minus 2 trace t. And we can use that to reflect the trace in, rearrange the equation, and we get the following answer. t mu minus 1 over d minus 2, where the d minus 2 comes from here, minus trace of t. Since we're relativistic, instead of thinking about the energy, we should think about the action. We don't want to restrict ourselves to static sources. And we can do the analog thing of where we solve this equation, uh, formally just by dividing my box, but of course we mean by that we mean some green function. Uh, and then uh, substituting in, uh, in the final answer. Uh, and when we do that, we get to quadratic order. T menu x one over box. That's really our green function. So I'll just write it as one over box. So now minus one over d minus two trace t of x one over box trace t of x bar. So this describes the analog of the interaction energy uh, between two sources. This literally is the generating functional. Uh, Free theory, uh, what was called again, what was usually denoted by WJ uh, in field theory textbooks. So, this is the generating function in terms of external uh, sources T. Um, now, 
here I've done this computation in any dimensions, and you see that here you get a dimension-dependent factor. So in the case of four dimensions, uh, we have minus a half. In the case of five dimensions, we have minus a third. Now why is this important? Well, I did this computation for Einstein-Hilbert gravity. So in five dimensions, uh, a massless graviton in five dimensions has five degrees of freedom. Four dimensions, we, we all know it's got two, but a massless graviton in five dimensions has five physical propagating degrees of freedom. Um, so there are five types of gravitational waves in five dimensions. Uh, and when we, if we do now, if we run the Klein theorem, we compactify from five dimensions down to four dimensions. That massless graviton in 5D will become a tower of, of, of massive states in four dimensions. Uh, but the number of degrees of freedom doesn't change. So that means that each, each element of the tower, each massive graviton in four dimensions will also have five degrees of freedom, which we know by uh, a representation theory for the Poincaré group is the correct answer. It's just 2s plus 1. S is 2, so 5 degrees of freedom. Uh, but it will inherit, and this is the crucial point, it inherits the minus a third factor from the five-dimensional answer. So that what that means, and I've done this as a shortcut, um, but you can show this by brute force by starting with the fierce pauli theory for a massive graviton, coupling that to a stress energy, and computing uh, the analog action between two stress energies, and you'll find that for a massive graviton, precisely as you expect from this dimensional reduction, for a massive graviton, you get minus a third here, and not minus a half. And that is the VDVZ discontinuity. Uh, so because, so if I just took a mass, single massive graviton, four dimensions, Then, uh, this, this is our, uh, let's try that in four dimensions, let's try that in four again, concreteness. So a massive graviton in four dimensions, coupling to stress energy, conserve stress energy, simplicity, then we will find uh, that that interaction potential of the generating functional uh, will have to minus a third there. Whereas a massless graviton in four dimensions will have the minus a half. And that's what you get from uh, Einstein held the graviton. Now, clearly, if you eyeball this for a second, you realize that uh, um, if we're looking at relativistic sources where the trace of the stress energy is zero, there is no distinction between the two. But if we're looking at non-relativistic sources where typically only t is zero, zero is not zero, and the rest are negligible, so the trace of t is uh, equal to uh, minus t zero, zero, in my convention, so this is non-zero, then you'll get a different answer. Now, as uh, Professor Rosen said earlier, of course, in practical terms, we can, uh, there's a, we can choose to renormalize this coefficient in different ways. So if we took a static source, we'll get one answer here and one answer there, and I can choose to normalize the coefficients in the same way there, but when we look at a relativistic source, then it'll be different. Or we can normalize the about relativistic and we get different for static. So the point is, it's really the conflict between the force law and the static case and the relativistic case, 
that gives you a different answer. And so that's why, as she said earlier, that if you compute the uh, gravitational lensing or the gravi deflection of light uh, from massive graviton, you'll get the wrong answer. Yeah, and this is the origin of this mean. DBZ is going to move. Now, if that were the end of the story, we would never think about the theory of relativity um, because it would just be ruled out phenomenolog phenomenologically. Um, but it, that isn't the case. Uh, and the reason is this minus a third is really minus a half plus a six. By which I mean that you can think of uh, the uh, interaction energy in the massive case as the massless one, uh, so you can think of the massive as the massless. Oh, and I guess I've been, I'm sorry, of course I should have put the mass in there. That was an unfortunate error. This is massive. Uh, but you, uh, you get the point, it's really this factor. So you can think of the, the massless limit of the massive one as the massless plus an extra contribution that goes like the six, uh, the zero normalization out here, plus a six uh, T, one over box T. And this is a contribution that comes from a coupling directly to the trace of the stress energy. And this is the, a classic contribution from a scalar. So in fact, uh, it was considered earlier what you get for a scalar toy model of gravity. Essentially what we have is that the massive limit gives ordinary einstein Hilbert gravity plus an extra force propagated by a scalar, which if we rewrote it in its local action form, would have up to some normalization. I'll call it scalar pi, because that's what's normally coupling to. Essentially you have an extra scalar in the game, which is coupling to the trace of the stress energy. And that scalar is uh, the uh, is uh, what is called uh, is is basically what is called the Galilean. And I'll have to get to next time why that's occurring. But what's happening here is that if we think about the rep the realm of the representation theory, a massive spin two particle uh, we know has two s plus one degrees of freedom. But when we take the massless limit, we shouldn't think about spin anymore. We should think about helicity. In the massless limit, you really have a, a helicity two modes, two helicity two modes, two helicity one mode, and one helicity zero mode. In other words, if you like a tensor, a vector, and a scalar. Now, as we take the massless limit, this thing is just the thing that reproduces the ordinary einstein hilbert gravity, uh, which gives you the minus a half contribution. The vector doesn't enter, because we're looking at here at the force law between two conserved sources, and vectors have to couple to uh, d mu, t mu nu, which we're assuming is zero, because we're looking at conserved sources. So this, this is there, but it's basically irrelevant in what we've computed. But this guy, it doesn't disappear. And this is the guy that I'm calling pi down here, is the Lissy zero mode of the mass of graviton that still propagates a force between two uh, sources through this uh, trace stress energy coupling. And so that's the origin of the BDZ discontinuity, is that you can't help, because degrees of freedom have to match up when you take the limit. It's, it's, not a, it's not a silly statement to say the massless limit of a massive theory is not the massless one, because you have this extra degree of freedom that doesn't decouple, you don't get the same problem with spin one, uh, because in that case it does decouple. But for spin two is when it first shows up. You have this extra degree of freedom, and if you trusted the weak field calculation, you would get the wrong answer in comparing relativistic and, and non-relativistic sources, so you get the wrong answer for the bending light around the sun and so on. And why this is not the end of the story, as we'll see later, is that um, pi, the scalar, uh, instead of, unlike, scale that sets the typical interactions in this theory, 